images from the Colossians text when I read earlier today, and that was one of the subjects of the chat. Let's see what happens. Let's take a moment of silent prayer that God might speak to us through this. So in kindergarten and first grade, uh, we lived, when I was in kindergarten and first grade, we lived on the campus of the University of Iowa where my dad was getting a doctorate. Go Hawkeyes, all right? So I was a, I was a Hawkeye before I was a Buckeye. Um, anyway, so um, kindergarten and first grade, my mother had two other children who didn't go to school. So I walked to school by myself every day. It was a mile away. Um, and rain, snow, whatever, you just did it. I mean, it's 19, what, 59 or something, 60. Uh, well, one day, uh, so I was always supposed to go the same route, back and forth, but this one day, uh, it, was, it was snowing, we're having so much fun, I went with some friends, and we're making snow for, I mean, just like got carried away, right? I just forgot, I was in first grade, I was having fun. My mother apparently went out looking for me in the snow, leaving the other children at home. My dad was in classes. Uh, and then she came back without me. Well, I come in the door finally, and my sister meets me in the door, and my mother is laying on the couch, and my sister says, you killed mommy! <laughs> so that's why I've been in therapy most of my life. <laughs> it's amazing to think that uh, kindergarten, first grade, I would walk that distance. I remember when my children were born, and they started to be old enough to go outside. I don't think I ever let them go outside by themselves. You know, unless we had one of our dogs kind of out there changing a tree. It's a different time, isn't it? Maybe it wasn't such a different time even back when I was in Iowa. Three days they couldn't find me. Can you imagine what they were going through? Um, looking everywhere, not knowing um, if he'd been lost, if someone had taken him, if he'd died. It just, it's a horrible story when it comes right down to it. And then Jesus you know, goes after his mom when she says a legitimate question. Why did you do this to us? What? Didn't you know where I'm supposed to be? What's wrong with you? It's kind of an interesting story, isn't it? It's the only story we have about Jesus as a child and his misbehavior. I think that's kind of significant. <laughs> there are other stories about Jesus as a child, but they didn't make it into the New Testament, probably because they were just so odd and, and weird. So there's the one story where Jesus is out with all his buddies and friends and they're playing along a riverbank and there's some mud and Jesus makes the mud into a little clay pigeon and then he makes the clay pigeon come alive and it flies off. And uh, one of the kids in the group just thinks that he shouldn't have done that and he starts to accuse Jesus and so Jesus looks at him and boom, strikes him down dead. <laughs> Mary comes out, Jesus! <laughs> what did you do? You bring that boy back right now. And so he does. <laughs> and then there's this other great story uh, about Joseph the carpenter. So he's a carpenter and he's, he's uh, you know, doing this uh, work on a big long plank. And those of you who are carpenters or handy men or women uh, know that you're supposed to measure twice, cut once, right? That's the measure twice, cut once. Well, Joseph apparently only measured once and then he cuts it too short. So what does he do? Hey, Jesus. And Jesus makes the board go longer. <laughs> That's all you need when you make mistakes is Jesus. <laughs> Actually, that's not far from the truth. All you need is Jesus when you make mistakes. The significance of the story is that he shows himself already at a young age to be something different. He's drawn to the temple, something about the temple. He needs to be there. It's not just that it's his father's house claiming kind of divine uh, status, but rather something about the temple is compelling to him. He's exploring now, beginning to understand that maybe his life is going to be different. He's going to be called to be a prophet. I don't know what the young Jesus actually knew about who he was or his miraculous birth or all that stuff. But apparently, at some point, he came to understand that he was set apart for something special. The next story that we hear that Jesus is in the temple is at the end of the Gospel of Luke. It's when he goes into his father's house and he sees what they've done to it. They've turned it into a 
den of thieves, of robbers. Got all these animals that are penned up, that are selling to people at exorbitant prices. They're requiring the poor to give every last penny into the coffer. And Jesus is incensed by that. It's a righteous indignation and anger that look what you've done to this place of prayer. Look at how you've corrupted it. So he overturns tables and drives out the money changers and lets the animals go free. Some people say uh, and speculate that the reason they killed Jesus is precisely because he cleaned out the temple. He was messing with their commerce and they couldn't have that. There was so much money just pouring into Jerusalem during Passover that for Jesus to challenge that, he was challenging everything they held dear. And so they decided, we got to get rid of this stuff. we got to kill it. I suggest that the most important temple that Jesus enters after he is on the cradle of the cross is the temple of the tomb. So that he enters so fully into our reality to our existence that he ends up like you and I will end up one day as dead as dead can be gone from this plane but he enters into the temple of the tomb and in that place of mystery something happens a light shines in the darkness the stone rolled away and Jesus resurrected never to die again is why we can sing that sort of odd verse in the song, you gentle sister death. An interesting way to talk about something that you and I are trying to avoid as long as possible. Talk about something that separates us from those that we hold dear. And you gentle sister death. How can we have that conversation except that Christ, the light of Christ has entered your gloom so that death no longer has power over us. Death is no longer the last word for us or for those we love. So we're called now to fully live in to this life of faith. And that's why that Colossians passage is so beautiful because of the way it starts. Dearly beloved, you're chosen by God. Chosen by God wasn't secondhand thing. No, you were God's first choice. <laughs> Chosen by God, dearly beloved. Now live into that identity that we hear first at the waters of baptism. You are a child of God, sealed by the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever. Nothing can separate you now from that one who calls you dearly beloved, which is why we enter in to the life of faith wearing a particular wardrobe, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. I use this text a lot in weddings. You know, you put all that effort into dressing up, um, spend a lot of money for something that takes about 15 minutes. Even with communion, it doesn't go very long. It's a lovely day, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying I don't like it. It's just that there's a lot of effort put into this one moment. My question always to the couple is, when they use this passage, this is a wonderful thing, but my question is, what will you wear tomorrow? More importantly, what are you going to wear when the two of you sit down and realize that your income is less than your bills? What are you gonna wear when you look at that one who you've committed your life to and you think, you know what? I don't believe you just said that or did that. You have to bear with each other and forgive. I heard a program just this morning about forgiveness on NPR. The person who's written a book on forgiveness had this one line I really liked. She said, forgiveness is a gift to yourself. It's a gift to yourself so that you're no longer weighed down by all those things that rob us of joy and peace so you don't harbor resentment in your heart. So you don't set the bar so high for everybody else, but keep it pretty low for yourself. Forgiveness is a gift for you because it's freedom. And we are to forgive as the Lord 
forgave us. Well, how did the Lord forgive us? The Lord forgives us. By dying our death. Ahead of us, instead of us. So that we might now live fully into that life of faith. The Lord forgives without reservation. It's God's nature to forgive, to restore, to reconcile, to put the pieces of our broken lives back together so that we might experience the joy of the future in our present. So, dear friends in Christ, it's what I call the Lutheran two-step. God acts, we respond. God forgives, and we live in to that life of faith. To that God be all glory, honor, and praise now and always.